Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Washington Coalition of Sexual Assault Programs webinar on the impact and application of Washington Sexual Assault Protection Order Statute. My name is Logan Michael. I'm the Child Advocacy Specialist here at WICSAP, and I've had the pleasure of coordinating this webinar with our presenter, Laura Jones. Trainings on topics such as this are one of the ways in which WICSAP strives to support your work as advocates for sexual assault survivors. So for those of you who may be less familiar with the coalition, um, we're also available to you for any questions or resource needs you may have in your daily work. Uh, before we get started, just want to cover the standard logistics for today. Um, hopefully everyone's hearing the audio okay through your phone line. Please let us know via the chat box in the corner of your screen if you're having any problems with volume or clarity. Um, we'll also be using the chat function for questions and comments throughout the webinar. Your phones are currently muted, so if you would like to ask a question over the phone line, please press star 7 to unmute your phone and star 6 to mute again. Um, Laura is going to be responding to questions as we go this morning, but we'll try to save a few minutes at the end to answer um, any of those last-minute questions as well. In your reminder email for today, there were two resources available for download, Laura's slides from today's presentation and a copy of the Court Watch report with some more in-depth information about their program and findings. So if you didn't receive this email, just let me know and I am happy to forward those resources to you. Following the webinar today, you will be receiving an email that confirms your attendance and your training hours. So go ahead and print that off for your records. And this email will also include a copy of the presentation slides. We will be posting the webinar recording and materials on our website under the Trainings and Events tab. So please check back in a week or two to access this or um, refer a colleague if they weren't able to join us today. And if you are sharing a computer with a colleague who either didn't register or didn't log in using their link, um, please just send me a quick email with their information so we know who's with us today and I can make sure that everyone receives proof of their training hours. My email is just logan, L-O-G-A-N, at wixap.org. And finally, if you could please um, fill out the evaluation at the conclusion of today's webinar, we'd certainly appreciate that. So we are very excited to have Laura Jones with us today to discuss the King County Sexual Assault Resource Center's Court Watch Program and to explore the sexual assault protection order trends in Washington. As the Court Watch Program Manager, Laura analyzes the data collected by program volunteers and follows up with community and professional stakeholders to the justice system to improve the process for victims. So if you are ready, Laura, I will turn things over to you. Great, thank you, Logan, and good morning, everyone. Uh, I've been really looking forward to today's presentation. Um, we've been focused on how SAPO's or sexual assault protection orders are handled in King County. So I'm very interested to learn about and hope we can have some interesting discussion about what's happening around the state. And um, as I uh, advance through my slides here, I'll, I'll just be announcing um, slide um, so that you'll know to change. So let's go ahead and get started. Here's what I hope to cover um, during today's presentation. I'd, I'd like to give a brief overview about our Court Watch program, as well as the monitoring project design for the, our monitoring of the sexual assault protection order process. And I'll be referring to sexual assault protection orders throughout the rest of the webinar as SAPOs. I know there are different pronunciations for the acronym that are used um, around the state, but that's the one that we use here. Um, I'm also going to be presenting on our Court Watch findings and our recommendations for improvement that were made about what we'd observed about the process. And then I'm hoping that there will be some um, discussion from all of you about um, the SAPO process in your county and statewide to identify both positive and negative trends. Uh, slide. So let me just give a very brief overview about Court Watch. Um, our program was founded by King County Sexual Assault Resource Center in 2010 as a way to gather information about the courts through observation and research. 
We um, employ volunteers from the community, and they primarily are observing uh, sexual assault protection order proceedings and criminal cases involving sexual assault charges in King County Superior Court, so mostly uh, felony criminal cases. Uh, the information that we and our volunteers collect is then used to follow up with system personnel and stakeholders to improve how the courts handle these cases. And one of the ways that we follow up is by preparing reports on the process. And um, as Logan stated, you should have all have received a copy of our report on the SAPO process, which is the basis for the webinar today. Um, we believe that court monitoring of sexual assault cases is beneficial and important because it promotes transparency in the proceedings. It raises awareness of some of the unique issues associated with sexual assault cases and it provides data that supports anecdotal evidence about what's happening in the courts. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Court Watch um, and our program specifically, setting one up in your county, uh, feel free to visit our website at um, www.kcsarc.org, or you can email me directly, um, and my email is ljones at kcsarc.org. Uh, slide. So why did we decide to focus on SAFOs um, when we were starting our program? Well, they seem like a logical focus point for court monitoring because they were relatively new, and there seemed to be a lot of issues and variants in how these cases were handled. Um, I know there are a few folks on this call from out of state, so let me just give a very brief background um, on SAFOs in Washington. So prior to 2006, when the um, SAPO law was passed, somebody who was sexually assaulted could petition the court for a domestic violence protection order if they were assaulted by someone who was a member of their family or household. And then if the perpetrator was not a member of their family or household, a victim was um, able to petition the court for an anti-harassment order if he or she could show a course of uh, harassing conduct, um, which the courts have interpreted to mean more than one occurrence. So, for the victim who was assaulted once by a non-family or household member, so a neighbor, classmate, acquaintance, coach, uh, there was no civil protection order remedy for them until the SAPO Act was passed in 2006. Now, a victim of sexual assault may be granted a protection order if he or she can prove by a preponderance of the evidence that um, he or she was a victim of non-consensual sexual contact or penetration by the respondent. Um, I believe that there are approximately 17 states or so that have something similar to the type of protection order for sexual assault victims. Um, slide. So to give you an overview about um, what our design was for monitoring SAPOs, uh, we took a look at the court records for all of the SAPO cases that were filed in or transferred to King County Superior Court in 2010, and this primarily included reviewing dockets, um, so just what had happened in the case from start to finish um, so that we could monitor how long the proceedings took, number of continuances, number of judges involved, that sort of thing, as well as looking at petitions and final orders. And then our volunteers and staff also observed and took notes on 51 uh, SAPO hearings in 41 different cases in King County Superior Court. And uh, we developed a monitoring form to capture certain information about these proceedings, which I've included in this presentation. And I'll go ahead and advance um, to the next slide so we can take a look at that. Um, so you can see here um, that the form, you know, it includes a lot of um, just basic case identifying information, demographic information, and information about um, who the players were in that first participant information section. Um, then in the courtroom environment section, we were monitoring for a lot of accessibility issues. How easy was it to find um, where the cases were happening? Um, was it posted? Um, that sort of a thing. Then under the hearing section was sort of the, the meat and bones about um, what the judge um, asked for, what evidence was presented, and if you advance to the next slide here, um, what the outcomes were and what rationale were given for those outcomes. And we also have a section on um, safety issues um, as well that, was, that were monitored for. So I'm gonna go ahead and advance to the next slide here um, to talk about some of our findings. 
So we made a number of um, positive um, er, findings about the process, um, primarily that um, it really filled a gap that had previously existed for many sexual assault victims. In 2010, we observed that 88% of the people who were seeking SAPOs would not have qualified for a DVPO or AH, uh, and, um, excuse me, a domestic violence protection order or anti-harassment order. And um, we also continued tracking the SAPO cases in 2011, and we found that 84% of petitioners were not family or household members. So it really did um, create a protection order for a lot of people that previously were unable to get protection. Um, we also searched for violations of SAPOs in our county and did not find any cases where a respondent was charged with a violation of a SAPO from 2010. So it appears that um, SAPOs are an effective tool to protect victim safety. Um, next slide. So some of our um, findings and recommendations for improvement focused on um, procedural issues that we observed. Um, and I'm not going to talk about all of them in today's presentation. We made 12 recommendations for improvement, um, and all of our findings are in the report. I think today I'm going to focus on the um, access to justice issues, including service of process, um, the rules of evidence, consistency between judges, advocacy, and legal representation. And the format for the rest of the presentation, will, there will be a poll question at the beginning of each um, issue for you all to answer. And then I'll share the law on that issue and what our findings were, um, what our recommendations were, and then there will be time for discussion on each issue. So let's go ahead and talk about the first issue, which was service of process. So if you go to the next slide here, um, this question um, says, the personal service requirement presents a problem for your client, A, never, B, rarely, C, often, D, always. Go ahead and answer, and then we'll just wait for the results here. Okay, looks like there are a few, we're waiting on a few more responses. Um, okay, so let's, oh, a few more here. Just while we're waiting on a few more responses, I'll just um, talk about the, the law on the service in Washington here. So. As um, most of you from Washington are probably aware, uh, the SAFO statute requires that the respondent is personally served with the petition, temporary order, and notice of hearing. Um, and this is different from all other types of protection orders in the state. Um, domestic violence protection orders, anti-harassment orders, and some of the other ones allow alternative means of service, such as um, publication or through mail um, if um, the petitioner is repeatedly unable to serve the respondent. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and skip to the results here. So it looks like um, never and 11% and then rarely and often seem to be the most popular and always 8%. Okay, so it seems like service of process is an issue um, in other counties as well. Um, so. I'm going to go ahead and um, share our findings about the service of process um, issue here in King County. As we were observing these SAPO cases, we found that in 29% um, of cases that made it past the um, ex parte hearing, the personal service requirement presented an issue. And we considered it an issue when there were um, three or more hearings um, and so we had 10 cases with three or more hearings, and that means that it took at least eight weeks for the case to get resolved, figuring that a case is continued um, two weeks at a time. Um, I see some questions here. Let me just pop back to the other slide. There were um, how many programs voted is a question I'm seeing. So 
we showed 38 um, different responses to that um, to that poll question there. I'm not sure if all the people who answered are from different programs, though. Logan, do you know that? Um, yeah, it doesn't differentiate by program. Um, just based on people's registrations, I think there is a pretty good diversity of counties throughout the state on the on the call today, though. Okay, thank you. So if, if we go back to the, the slide on the services process here, um, so as I said, there were 10 cases that we saw with three or more hearings, which meant that the cases lasted about two months um, to get a resolution. And then we saw nine cases where the petitioner just stopped showing up to court um, because they were unable to serve the respondent and just kind of disengage with the process. Um, we also, as I mentioned, has been tracking the cases in 2011 as well. And um, for 2011, we saw that the average length to resolution of SAPO cases was about four weeks um, after the um, ex party hearing. So there was an average of about two hearings per case, and the majority of the continuances um, were granted to allow the petitioner time to effect service. So with service of process being an issue, I'll go to the next slide here, our recommendations for improvement were, one, that um, RCW 7.90 be amended to allow alternative means of service via publication or mail not only to make the process um, more, you know, make it easier for petitioners, but also to make it just sync up with all of the other types of protection orders um, for Washington just so that there's some consistency. And we also recommended that um, maybe there are some alternative ways um, to allow continuances, such as uh, telephonically allowing a petitioner to call into the court to continue the hearing. Um, so that they don't have to continue coming back to court every two weeks until the respondent is served or until they give up. Um, and we talked with some Pierce County advocates, um, and, and they said that that happens um, down there sometimes. So I'm wondering if, if we go to the next slide, um, as we have so many different counties represented on this webinar, um, are there ways for a petitioner to continue a hearing without physically coming to court in your county or have you come up with any other creative solutions um, to this issue? Let's just open it up um, either via chat or, I don't know, if folks want to unmute their lines and kind of chime in about that. Okay, well, one thing that we have seen, um, let's see, we have someone from Snohomish County saying that um, they have not found another way for petitioners. Um, in uh, Spokane County, someone saying that law enforcement provides service for SAPOs, and, and that's true um, a lot of the time in King County as well, but um, after they make an attempt, if they're unable to get service, a lot of the time that's it for law enforcement. Um, and somebody else, I'm not sure, uh, Karen, what county are you from? Benson County, not aware of other ways. Have people seen um, judges continue a case for longer than two weeks to allow uh, for a petitioner to get service? Okay, we're seeing um, the Quinault Indian Nation at times allows petitioners to be present telephonically. Okay, okay. Well, I think I'll go, let's see. Uh, we have someone saying that I had one that was continued for three weeks, but petitioner then gave up when it could not be served on the respondent. Okay. Yeah, I think a lot of the time in King County we see where people just give up because they're unable to serve, or sometimes the judges will um, just say, okay, there have been three attempts, um, I'll dismiss this case without prejudice and you can refile if the respondent makes contact. Um, 
And I'm, I'm seeing similar responses from Skagit and Yakima County that if they don't go to court, the order is dropped. Okay. All right. Well, sounds like that's an issue across the board, and other than telephonically, there don't seem to be any other sort of workarounds to that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and move on to the next issue here, um, the next slide as well which is about how judges run the SAPO hearings um, related to the rules of evidence. So in your county, do judges run SAPO hearings, A, informally, relaxing the rules of evidence, um, B, as many trials, or C, depends on the judge? And go ahead and take some time to answer that question, and then um, I'll share the results here. And I'll just, as people are responding, I'll just briefly talk about the sort of the background behind um, the evidence rules as they relate to SAPOs. Um, when the SAPO statute was originally passed, um, there was no guidance about the rules of evidence, and so I think uh, many courts weren't sure how to proceed and began running the cases as if they were um, many trials. And then in 2007, the rules of evidence were updated to allow judges um, the option of relaxing the rules of evidence in SAPO hearings, which they were already allowed to do um, in domestic violence protection order and anti-harassment order proceedings. Um, so um, that gave them the discretion to relax the rules, but um, I think as we're seeing, not all of the judges exercise that discretion. And I'll go ahead and um, show the results. Now I have 32 responses. Um, so, the large majority, it depends on the judge, and, and that's what we've seen in King County, too. Um, if I'm going to skip here to the next slide. And um, in the cases that we observed, um, some of the judges ran the hearings rather informally, um, a lot more similarly to how domestic violence or protection order hearings or anti-harassment protection order hearings are run in King County, and then others ran them as many trials, even the, referring to them as trials. Um, so we saw that when there was the more relaxed approach, judges would say, tell me what I need to know, do you have anything to add to the petition, and then if a petition was brought on behalf of a um, somebody under 16, the parent or guardian did not need to bring them and to testify in front of those judges. And then with the judges who ran the hearings like trials, we noted that um, a lot of time there was direct and cross-examination. Uh, hearsay was not permitted, so um, sometimes judges would require children, minors, to come in and testify, and testify even if the order was filed um, by a parent or guardian. Um, judges stated that they would not consider the petition in making their decision um, that all of the evidence had to be presented in the hearing and they allowed um, legal objections. And a lot of the time that they were more like trials, there were attorneys involved too, and that made things a little more technical. Um, one thing um, that we observed recently um, is a judge kind of adopting both of these, um, relaxing the hearings and then treating it like a trial as well. Um, recently we observed a hearing that was um, seven hours long. Um, there were several witnesses who took the stand. There was lots of evidence that was admitted, maps, um, lots of witnesses. And then um, during the proceedings, the judge allowed in some evidence of the petitioner's uh, sexual history, saying that the court did not have to follow the rules of evidence, um, referring to the rape shield statute there. So she was sort of picking and choosing which um, rules she wanted to relax and enforce. Um, so I'm going to skip the next slide and I'll talk about what our recommendation for improvement was, which was that the court should relax the rules of evidence in SAPO hearings as allowed by evidence rule 1101C4. Um, and I think stressing that the majority of these cases do not involve attorneys and um, 
relaxing the rules of evidence makes the process much more accessible to the average petitioner or respondent. Um, and I'm not sure, does anyone have anything to share about how this issue has played out in their county? Oh, a lot of people to chime in or weigh in on the chat feature. One of the things that we've done um, as part of court watches, we offer um, judges the opportunity to receive confidential feedback about their courtroom. And so um, it's sort of a voluntary um, thing that judges sign up for, and then we send feedback on a periodic basis to them. And so when we've seen um, judges running them more like trials, we've commented, um, you know, sort of compiled all of the volunteer notes so that we're not commenting on specific cases, but then compiled what it is that we've seen in their court and direct their attention to the fact that they do have discretion to relax the rules of evidence. Yeah, and um, Megan Allen, who's uh, in uh, King County Advocate, is saying that um, it really does depend on the involvement of attorneys, too, if um, making the process more technical or not. Uh, somebody said, uh, Julia, what county are you from? Um, there's a case where a judge allowed the petitioner and respondent to bicker back and forth to each other, and uh, this is in Snohomish County. The judge did not intervene, and it lasted for many minutes. Has anyone ever seen um, when there are two uh, pro se or unrepresented um, parties, so a petitioner and a respondent who don't have attorneys, um, them be allowed to question each other. And in Snohomish County, they're saying yes. Thurston County as well. Pierce, yes. Clallam, yes. Okay. So that's a big issue, and, and one thing that is sort of in the works, and I'll cover a little bit more at the end of the presentation here, is um, a bench guide for uh, judges to reference as they're presiding over sexual assault cases, and one of the chapters in that guide is going to focus specifically on sexual assault protection orders, and so there will be sort of a bench card or checklist of things to consider, and, and the evidence rule is going to be one of the primary considerations, alerting them to the fact that they can relax them. Um, so I'm going to move ahead to the next um, issue, which is related to this one. It focuses on consistency among judges, commissioners, or whoever hears these cases in your county. So if you go to the next slide, there's another poll question, and it says, in your county, SAPO cases are, A, always heard by the same judge or commissioner, B, heard by different judges or commissioners, or C, other. And I'll go ahead and wait for your results here. Um, and just to give you a little bit of background on how things run in King County, because I know every county is different, the um, sexual assault protection orders and the anti-harassment orders are heard together, um, and they're separate from domestic violence order um, proceedings. So I know that's a little bit different than how things are run in other counties. So I'll go ahead and show the results here. We have about 31 responses. Um, looks like there are a few people that are, are from courts where it's always heard by the same judge, but the overwhelming majority of these cases are heard by different judges. And, and that's true um, if you want to go to the next slide here in King County. Um, the judges rotate through the SAPO calendar, I think, on a, on a monthly basis, although that doesn't always true. Um, and then in uh, 2011, we kept track of all of the judges who were involved, and so we observed that there were up to three different judges involved in each SAPO case. So one case, three different judges, depending on how many continuances were granted. 
And there are currently 49 judges in King County Superior Court, and 28 of those judges presided over at least one SAPO. And there were also three pro tems, um, or substitute judges, uh, who presided over the SAPO calendar as well. Um, and every one of these judges ran the hearings completely differently. Um, and some of those were the, the issue of the trial versus the informal hearing that we um, just talked about. Uh, the order that cases are heard in, you know, because the anti-harassment and SAPO cases are heard together, um, some of the judges were calling, you know, it made for a packed courtroom, and some of the judges were sort of calling the, the SAPO cases first, or there didn't seem to be an order. Some saved them toward the end, sort of out of respect for privacy of the victims. Um, and then some of the judges uh, did a really good job of familiarizing the parties with the applicable statutes, reading them aloud before the hearing starts. Um, others did not do that. So those are some of the differences that we observed um, from judge to judge. So if you go to the next slide here, um, our recommendations for improvement were to um, call the cases in a predictable order that best upholds privacy of the parties. And we gave a um, recommended order in our report um, that hopefully the, the courts would adopt. Um, and so it basically our, our recommended order was that um, cases where there wasn't service were called first, get those folks in and out of the courtroom quickly, then cases where there was only one party present and there was proper service, um, maybe it would there wouldn't be a lot of involved testimony um, and an order would either be granted or denied, um, and then anti-harassment cases and then SAPO cases was sort of our, our recommended order. Um, since our report came out, um, things have changed a little bit in King County where the majority of anti-harassment cases are now heard in district court. Um, and only cases involving um, minors are heard in Superior Court, and that's helped a lot with the issue of packed courtrooms and protecting victim privacy. Another recommendation that we made was um, that the judge should make an announcement to the gallery about the order in which cases were heard, will be heard to help, um, you know, prepare them uh, mentally. You know, it's, being in court is sort of a nerve-wracking experience, so they can know what to expect. Also, so that they didn't have to sit in there and listen to a bunch of hearings that they were going to be heard at the end, um, they could, um, you know, know what their schedule, more of what their schedule is going to be like. And then our final recommendation was that the SAPO statute be read aloud by the judge prior to hearing the cases so that the parties could be re-familiarized about what it is that they needed to prove at the hearing. Um, let's get to the next slide. I'm wondering... Um, in counties where there are, you know, the majority, it seems, have different judges handle, handling these cases, um, is consistency an issue? And then are there any solutions or workarounds that um, people have come up with in their county? Are there any counties that um, already do some of the things that we've recommended? Let's wait a few minutes. We have a response about Spokane County. Um, most of the SAPO hearings are in district court, and then with kids, they're in superior court for consistency. I think one of the issues about having um, so many different personnel involved also is that where a judge is only on the rotation for a month or so, and if they're hearing an average of one or two cases, um, a week, they don't really have the opportunity to get really, really familiar with the law about SAPOs um, as well. And then when it turns over, it's somebody new acclimating themselves to the statute. Um, so that's another issue. And 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 the just the person from Spokane or someone saying that um, they try to let the petitioner know that each SAPO is different and that she should prepare for that. 
and certainly that is one thing that uh, legal advocates here um, work with their clients on. It definitely, if there was some sort of a predictable order, it definitely would make it a little bit easier to prepare clients um, for court and emotionally and um, as well as what they should have together for the hearing. Um, somebody uh, from, Spokan oh, from Spokanigan is saying that district court is consistent with the same judge who understands staffers and victim issues, but um, not the cases in superior court. So I'm going to go ahead and move on to um, the next issue here, um, which is related to advocacy. And there are two questions in a row. Um, the first is, do advocates accompany victims to court in your county, yes or no? Um, so go ahead and wait for responses there as they're coming in. So I'm, there's only one no, about 30 responses. I'll go ahead and skip to results. So it looks like in pretty much every county, um, advocates do accompany victims to court. Um, and if we go to the next slide here, um, do advocates assist the victims with filling out SAPO paperwork in your county, yes or no? Okay, again, I have almost 30 responses. They're all yeses, so I'll just skip to the results here. So, yeah, it looks like everybody pretty much helps with that. So, um, I'm going to go ahead and advance to the next slide, which talks about our findings on this issue. So, um, in the cases that we tracked, even though it, it looks like, like in King County as well as these other counties um, that you all are from, um, even though advocates are allowed to accompany um, victims to court and help with paperwork, there were only advocates in 35% of the cases that we observed. And this was really um, important because the success rate with an advocate was 80%, whereas the success rate without an advocate was only 34%. Um, some of the reasons why, I, you know, we suppose that the advocacy, or the success rate with an advocate was so much higher was legal advocates can help to determine whether or not a SAPO is the appropriate remedy for the situation or whether another order like a domestic violence order or anti-harassment order is more appropriate. Um, a legal advocate can help the petitioner prepare the petition, making sure that there's enough detail to meet the requirements of the statute. Um, they're able to explain the process to petitioners so they're better prepared for what to expect in court. Um, they have a support person there if an advocate does accompany them to court. And then by being connected to a legal advocate, there's a smaller chance that the petitioner would simply not show up to a hearing. So having an advocate is huge. If we go to the next slide here, um, our recommendation for improvement really centered around um, raising awareness that petitioners can have advocates assist them and um, making this information available um, in the clerk's office um, to people who are um, wanting to get a SAPO. Um, and uh, in our courthouse, it's sort of unique because we have um, system advocates who help with domestic violence orders and then um, mostly, well, we have three different agencies with advocates in King County. Um, but mostly community advocates for the sexual assault cases, and so um, we're not working directly in the courthouse, but making people aware that um, they have the right to have a victim present and to help them with their paperwork is really important. And then since this recommendation came out um, in 2011, we noted that um, advocacy rates were slightly higher, so closer to 50%. And again, we did see that more than half of the orders were granted when an advocate was involved, or um, there were also other resolutions, agreed orders, other things when an advocate was involved, and then um, there was only a 40% success rate without an advocate present in 2011. So if we go to the next slide, I'm wondering, um, is making awareness about advocacy 
an issue in anyone's county, and then um, if you have any strategies that you've employed to increase access and awareness to advocacy. Um, I'm just seeing a few responses. So in um, Benton County, someone is saying that it depends on what the petitioner wants, and if they want an advocate with them, we will go to court with them. And yeah, that's that's what we do here. Uh, someone's saying outreach and education far and wide. Um, one thing that, that we've been able to do um, since starting Court Watch in King County um, is uh, the Court Watch program gets all of the different court calendars for all the cases, which um, includes the SAPO cases. And so sometimes if um, we see that a petitioner does not have an advocate um, and we have um, staff free, we might send an advocate to court to offer them the opportunity to have someone assist them um, or accompany them um, during their hearing. Um, so in Spokane, or in, uh, someone saying they met with the clerks from the courthouse. Um, in Spokane, it looks like they work with judges and their staff to make advocacy referrals, and one judge puts their info with the protection order paperwork. Okay. So mostly education and outreach to clerk's offices and other court staff about, about advocacy. Great. I'm going to go ahead and skip on um, to the next issue. I want to make sure... Um, that we cover everything and then have enough time for questions at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and this concerns attorney involvement in uh, SAPO cases. So if you go to the next slide, just um, go ahead and answer this question. Have you seen a judge appoint an attorney for the petitioner when the respondent is represented? A, never, B, sometimes, C, always. And for those of you who aren't from Washington, the, there's a provision in the um, SAPO statute that does allow the court discretion to appoint an attorney for a petitioner if the respondent is represented by counsel. So there are about, let's see, a few more responses coming in, but um, nearing 30 responses. So. I'm going to go ahead and skip to the results here so we can talk about them. So it, it looks like there's a pretty even split between judges who never appoint an attorney and then judges who sometimes do. So in King County, we have, um, through Court Watch, have never seen a judge appoint an attorney for the petitioner. And I think... A lot of that um, comes from the fact that there aren't many attorneys who are familiar with these types of proceedings. In fact, I think the majority of petitioners that are represented by an attorney are represented by the same attorney from the um, Sexual Violence Law Center who um, handles a lot of these cases. Um, I'm wondering, um, let me oh, let me just um, get to the next slide here. Um, I, I think that the fact that um, attorneys are sometimes or never appointed in these cases is really um, significant because um, there, let's see, so in 2010 there were only eight petitioners represented and 11 respondents represented. So when both sides had an attorney, um, there was about a 50-50 chance of success. Where the petitioner was only represented and the respondent wasn't, um, the order was granted about 70%, 75% of the time. And then where the respondent only was represented, the cases were dismissed 100% of the time. So this really shows that um, it's a huge advantage to have an attorney um, and that it really does level the playing field when one party has an attorney to um, add another attorney. And I'm seeing some folks chiming in about um, a few comments about the um, legal representation in King County. So someone's saying that it happened 
when the petitioner was developmentally disabled, and then um, another person had said that a judge continued a hearing and then it was referred to the um, Sexual Violence Law Center for representation. Are there, um, let me just skip to the next slide, are there um, attorneys in your county that um, have expertise in SAPOs or what, for those of you who say that um, attorneys are sometimes appointed, um, when does that happen? How does that happen? I've heard, um, I think it was Snohomish County, I've heard that um, sometimes public defenders get um, appointed for the petitioners. Um, so someone from Thurston County is saying they know of one case where the judge appointed an attorney in Thurston County, I'm not sure if the attorney had expertise, and yeah, that's the person from Snohomish County confirmed that that's what they do there. So does that ever create a conflict of interest that the public defenders represent the petitioners in those cases? And you feel free to unmute your lines as, as well and, and chime in. Um, and that's star seven to unmute. That's easier than typing it all out. Are there any counties that have um, a referral list of attorneys that um, have experience on these cases, or a, a list of go-to attorneys for this for these issues? Okay, someone from Yakima is saying that we do not have an attorney that is an expert with SAPOs. So it looks like one of the big issues is, um, oh, in Benton County and Franklin County, they're saying that they do have attorneys who have experience in that issue, and then um, in Clark County as well, there are some that do have experience, but it seems like there are a lot of counties where there are not um, people who have experience and the knowledge um, to represent petitioners. So that's an issue. I mean, it's a great um, provision in the statute, but practically speaking, it sounds like there are some, some issues about how um, judges go about doing that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and um, advance to the next slide. I wanted to share a resource with all of you about SAPOs. Related to um, the issues that we've talked about today and then other ones that we observed um, from Court Watch. And uh, this is, um, as I mentioned before, um, we're working on a bench guide um, for judges who, and it's specifically on sexual assault cases. Um, and we've come up with sort of a, a checklist um, or bench card for them of things to consider. Um, some of our advocates here at CaseArc have um, found it really handy to use um, when they go to court or when they work with issues or with clients as issues come up for their clients um, so that they have just a quick reference guide of, of what the law is. Um, so I, I thought I would share that with you all as well. Um, a good thing to um, direct folks' attention to with the, the RCW citations as well to support each um, checkpoint. So. Um, I can talk a little bit more about um, some of our other findings, but I'd like to just open it up to you all um, to ask questions, to um, talk about other things that have come up in your county. I mean, I think we've focused so much on King County and, and the beauty of this, this webinar is to learn about what's happening statewide to identify, you know, potential issues for legislative change, or is it an educational issue, and, and making sure that people have the right information. So it's, it's really great to speak with all of you. Um, yeah, I will go ahead. Someone's asking if the checklist um, could be made available, and um, I will go ahead, and I'll, I'll probably send that to Logan. Can I just send that to you, and then you could send it to the participants? 
Yeah, so what I will do is once I get it from you, I'll just attach it to that um, follow-up email that everyone will receive. So um, we can get that out today, hopefully. Okay, perfect. And I can also include, um, we did a, a brief sort of follow-up to um, the SAFO process for 2011. I can include that as well. Um, it includes similar information about trends and other, and other things um, that might be useful. So um, if there aren't any questions, uh, I can go ahead and talk a little bit more about some of our other um, findings and recommendations for improvement. Um, let's see. I um, One thing that in um, King County, and I'm, and I'm not sure if it happens in other counties where SAFOs and domestic violence orders are heard together, um, is that um, the safety issues about um, where people sit, where people go in the courtroom, um, it's not really clear. I know um, in some of the domestic violence courtrooms there is assigned seating for respondents and petitioners, um, and some there aren't. And then in these sexual cases, there's no um, assigned seating. Um, because they're heard separately from the domestic violence protection orders, um, there's often no security um, there. Um, so have people observed some of those issues as well in their courts? Someone, uh, and what county are you from, Trish? Spokane County. So someone from Spokane County is saying that advocates have been excluded from the courtroom because of space constraints at the start of hearings. Um, so how do we educate court staff without harming working relationships? Uh, that's, that's always a tough question. I think uh, that perhaps um, the checklist and the, the citation to the law showing that someone is legally entitled to have an advocate accompany them could be useful in that situation, just quickly making reference to that and, and citing the law um, as um, a reason to be able to be included in the courtroom. Also, the fact, um, I mean, courtrooms are open. I think someone's asking me why um, SAPO cases are not held with DV cases. Um, and I think that just came from the fact that when the um, law was passed, they had to figure out a place to put these SAPOs. Um, and the DV calendar is um, already um, pretty jam-packed. And so I think that's why it was put with the anti-harassment orders. But it is sort of um, interesting because um, you have a lot of um, neighbors, um, you know, bickering about disputes or, or sort of a lot of le seemingly less serious types of um, cases, and then you have somebody talking about how they were they were raped in the same courtroom, and it does create an interesting um, contrast and. Other people who I have talked to um, have said that, um, I think it was in Homish County as well, that um, SAPO cases um, are heard on their own calendar. And um, initially that seems like a great idea um, to best uphold privacy, but then because there are only one or two cases, then um, judges had the time to turn the hearings into full-blown trials, um, which was not a good thing. Yeah, and someone from Snohomish County is just timing in that that's what they do there. So, Well, Logan, I, I don't know if, if no one else has any questions. I think that's done and I can make the checklist and, and the, any of these other resources available um, for all of the participants here. Yeah, that sounds good. We can um, wrap up for today, and then certainly if people continue to think more about this or have some internal discussions and want to um, either follow up with information to share with WixOp and our policy efforts or 
you know, connect with you with other questions, we can certainly um, do that going forward. So um, thank you so much, Laura, for sharing your um, experiences and findings with us and being with us today. Great. Thank you for having me. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Please stand by.